Hi folks, it's Chris Ebert again with a lecture on forecasting, future gazing, predicting the future, name it what you will. It won't be esoteric, it is going to be about um, how to actually make this work. If you're working in any capacity as a designer, engineer, architect, uh, research and development worker in any capacity. The future, you know, we see it in films, we see it in novels. Uh, there are all kinds of different visions of what the future might be like. Some of them are informed by science, some of them surely by wishful thinking, imagination, or even pessimism, you name it. So we have all these utopian or dystopian visions of the future. And on the whole, we designers always need to live in the future because that is where our stuff is going to be made and consumed. As designers, we have to take an interest in the future and how it will probably be during the life cycle of our product, because that is the world we are designing it for. We can obviously design for different kinds of futures. Some might think the future is like this, and maybe there are futures like this, or like this, or like this. Personally, I think any thought is worth thinking. Me, for example, I think civilization is merely a crutch that we are sticking with at the moment to organize life. But actually, we will probably eventually be capable of changing our own bodies and our physical abilities to the point where we will no longer need a civilization because we can simply adapt our bodies to live within nature as it actually is. And that will be the end of environmental problem as we know them. Our civilization is killing this planet. So why don't we just change ourselves so that we no longer require a civilization and can just live in nature as it is? We could be like elves. Yeah, we could, uh, if we do some in, in enough uh, genetic manipulation, we may one day be able to just uh, live in the woods and eat raw stuff and need no blankets and need no heating systems. And obviously that would also mean no longer needing money or anything like that. So this is an extreme view of the future, but nevertheless, I believe it's, it's a possibility. So let's look at some techniques that are being used by industry and by interesting people who have managed to forecast the future successfully in the past. You may have heard of Isaac Asimov, <clears throat> a science fiction author, who made a few unsuccessful future predictions from 1964 about 2014. He also made a few successful ones, but I'll show you the unsuccessful ones first. He predicted, for example, that we would no longer have cables. He said that our appliances would all have built-in nuclear power plants and you would just run everything on small nuclear power plants by 2014. Now, I think this is still totally possible. It's just not going to be now. It'll be a little longer till we get this. He predicted that by 2014, we would have cars that fly. Most cars would fly. And of course, we have had a lot of people trying to build flying cars, but it has not become the standard yet. Asimov said that by 2014, moving sidewalks would be all over the cities. We have them in airports, but they haven't become quite as popular as he thought they might be. He predicted there would be a lot of underwater housing, which I think makes a lot of sense. You know, you get you take care of a lot of problems with heating and cooling and all that. It's just not 2014 that this is getting popular. It may be in the future yet. Asimov said that um, by 2014, we would mostly be eating pills. And we have a lot of supplements, it's true, probably more than we did in 1964. But it just isn't as popular as he thought it would be. 
he also predicted that everything in terms of drudgery and work would be taken care of by machines and that therefore the main problem of mankind would be boredom and people would just have to find ways to kill time. Now, this unfortunately isn't quite true yet either. <coughs> Asimov was right about a number of things though. He quite accurately predicted things like the GPS, which is satellite navigation, Skype as we know it, um, autonomous cars, smart kitchens, smart phones even, satellite communications, self-parking cars, flat screens and drones. Let's see a few more of these people. Um, arguably it would have been relatively easy for Asimov from the comfortable perspective of 1964 to predict these kinds of things because you get kind of a hunch of what's in the pipeline. But uh, the people I'm showing you now were a bit further back in history and what they came up with is therefore a bit more amazing. Jules Verne, Jules Verne in English, was a science fiction author from France who did his writing in the 19th century. And he predicted things like moon rockets and even how they worked. Take a look at these illustrations. We have a several phase unit here going towards the moon. It has the the American flag on it. It is, it is clearly landing in the US. And here's what actually happened later. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? So either the people who made the moon rocket read Jules Verne books or he just simply had a pretty good idea of what it would have to be like. Skype. Not entirely by that name, obviously, but the concept of being able to communicate in audiovisual media <clears throat> across distance was one that Jules Verne had in the 19th century already. He didn't know how to make it you know, happen technically, but he just thought, wouldn't it be nice? And I think that is what future gazing mostly boils down to personally. If you have a dream, if you think, wouldn't it be nice to be able to do this? Well, I think the point will come where somebody will do this. <coughs> we have this famous man, Le Corbusier, an architect, <clears throat> actually originally Charles Edouard Jeanne Gris, and he gave us th cities like these. And you may not think these are very special, but that's because they have become so popular ever since he came up with this concept. Uh, Le Corbusier had the idea that a city should be a place where you can have millions and millions of people live <clears throat> in a civilized way, a well-organized way in a small space. And of course, you want to reach everything by car. And... This was put into practice quite quickly. Here is uh, his concept City Radieuse in Paris, which introduced this perfectly new living concept for big cities, it made sense. He even created some of the interiors, which seem quite modern to us now, but we're talking stuff that's about 100 years old. And he even came up with this kind of office model, which is quite commonly used these days. And this is one of his old architectural models. So Le Corbusier foresaw the kinds of huge cities that we have now in China, in America, in all kinds of places in the world. Here's an image of Shanghai from 2015. You can see that this clearly um, yeah, echoes the previous slide. So this is exactly what Le Corbusier was envisioning and it clearly works. He may have taken it a little far in imagining that every house will want to be like this and uh, the enthusiasm for this kind of cubicle shaped uh, buildings uh, didn't go quite as far as he anticipated. <clears throat> he just thought that rich people would have houses like these as well. It's not exactly like that now is it? We still like our vernacular, pretty little things. Le Corbusier also gave us a car. Obviously, if he's going to be designing a city for the car, he needs to also put forward 
the ideal car for it. And he preempted the VW Beetle by quite a few decades with this concept. Now, the similarities are more than visual. <clears throat> Both of these vehicles have the engines at the rear and the boot or trunk at the front. And they're attempting to be aerodynamically optimized. At the time, the drop shape was deemed to be the most aerodynamic shape there is, and this is what he used. So his way of predicting the future, I think, was simply to employ sheer logic. How do you put a lot of people in one place? You stack them on top of each other. How do you make a car that makes sense? Well, you make it as aerodynamic as possible and put the engine at the back where it's not as noisy. Clear. So how did they do this then? Now, I've already mentioned that Le Corbusier used logic. And that is only one way. You may hold several different philosophies that um, may all be viable ways to predict what will happen in the future <clears throat> and what the future will be like. So Arthur C. Clarke, who is the author of the book on which Space Odyssey 2001 is based. Maybe you've seen that film. Stunning, actually, that film, because it was made in, I think, 1969, and still you watch it today, it, it looks like uh, current production. Anyway, on the side, um, he says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So this is what he says as a science fiction author. This is how you make it look right as a science fiction author. But I think we designers are also very much like science fiction authors. We are creating a future vision. And where is the best place to look for that? Well, of course, you want the future to do stuff almost as if by magic. So that should be your first thing as a designer. If you don't know yet how it'll be, well, start with magic. What would it be if it were magic? That's a very good starting point, because something that is like magic is very desirable, and there's a very good chance we actually have what it takes to make it happen. Not by magic, but by technology. Isaac Asimov himself said, all you have to do is take a close look at yourself, and you will understand everyone else. What I think he said really with this is, Whatever, whatever wishes, whatever desires you may have are probably shared by a lot of people. So if you do the kind of dreaming that I alluded to in the previous slide, you will not be alone with that. Gene Roddenberry, who wrote <clears throat> Star Trek, basically said this simple thing, in a better world, I can do anything. Again, a perfect manifesto for any designer as we are making a better world, and of course we want to be able to do anything that we can think of. So if you imagine a future, what do you mean I can do anything? Well, imagine you're in a wheelchair, you can walk. Imagine you're a human, you can fly yourself without machines. Imagine you are a pet owner, you can talk to your pet. You know, this is what I mean. Anything, anything you may want, you can do it. This is the future. And if you want that, well, you, then you have set the brief and then that is where it's going. It's like driving a car. You will go where you look. So you set the goals and that's the course. Jules Verne said, anything one man can imagine, other men can make real. This is something he said when he was criticized at the time of his writing about nuclear submarines and people living in, in sub, uh, submarine paradises, that he may not know how it's done, but somebody will. And that is the truth. There is a good 7 billion of us these days. A few of them might stick their heads together and can probably take something like like these wonderful fantasies he created as, a, as, as, as an orientation point to start something. Sid Mead, one of my favorite illustrators and, and artists, said, I've called science fiction reality ahead of schedule. 
And this, I think, is also a wonderful thing that applies to us product designers, industrial designers, transportation designers, probably architects as well. Science fiction may be reality ahead of a schedule. Um, design is also reality ahead of schedule. So always treat it as if it is the real thing. It's just not here yet. It will be in the future. Einstein himself said this interesting thing. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. What he, I think, meant by this is, <clears throat> if you look back as a designer and want to base your design on the existing, you're already uh, giving up the ability to envision and to dream up something new for the future. So imagining something new is always going to be of more impact than to rely on existing facts. And here's what I would tend to say. If you want to come up with the best possible thing, well, simply imagine what the ultimate solution would be able to do. Yeah, like I said, if you're in a wheelchair, the ultimate solution will be that you're not in a wheelchair and that you can walk around like a perfectly normal person. That is the ultimate solution. And between the reality and that vision is your job as a designer to make that possible. And it can be done. So do we have recipes to predict the future? I am of the opinion we product designers should do something like this. Identify what the design problem is really about. I have so often had students who went, oh, you know, I might just have a water kettle. Why are you going to choose to make a water kettle as a project when that is clearly already the solution? You should do something else. You should look at what the actual need is. Now, the need behind the water kettle is not to have a water kettle. The need is to heat water. And the need is probably to drink that water out of a cup, isn't it? So wouldn't the real need be to have tea? Something that makes tea. So <clears throat> simply pretend that you are like Gandalf and that you're bringing it about. Yeah, forget the water kettle. That's an intermediary step. It's cumbersome thing that somebody thought up once. There might be other ways to get hot water in a cup. How about a cup that has a microwave facility built in? Why not? We can do it. We have it. You know, we, we probably would have been able to build something like this 50 years ago already. We just didn't because people were too comfortable thinking, yeah, water comes from water kettles. So I think, and this is my personal recipe, um, in order to be able to dream up a great product that is completely new and surprising, you need to <clears throat> be able to stay current about emerging technology. Do we know what emerging technology is? Emerging technology is stuff that is just only now coming out. And you may not even have seen it in the media yet. You may need to read through research papers to get a glimpse of what that is. Uh, scientists somewhere in some corner of the world may be fiddling with something that could be the next big thing. That is emerging technology and you'll want to be in the know. And you can find these things by going on places like Google Scholar even to start with. Um, you may also want to stay current about emerging issues. And that's because you want something that is worth doing and doing it in the right way. So if you're going to be designing a swimming pool for Australia, you may want to be aware of the fact that water shortages are probably going to become more and more dramatic. So your swimming pool is going to have to reflect that. You will need to stay very critical about current solutions. And what I mean by that is as a designer, we, we do not say this is good enough. We never say what is currently on the market is great. It's not. 
okay take it from me and be disagreeable as I say here in the in the green box in the lower left corner the present solution always sucks okay it's never good enough and of course you can do better that is what you say as a designer that's why you exist and that is why they hire you and that is why you will get the job and of course you believe that you believe that there is a better way and there's always a better way now it may not be a vastly better way in every time but perhaps it's a slightly better way and that's better and that's good enough for industry and the market okay so be disagreeable be a nerd know your stuff and live in the future you may wonder when the best time is um, during the time of a project <clears throat> to predict the future so we have one thing we call the lead time and the lead time is the first thing we ask about when we are given a new project so right from the word go we are concerned <clears throat> to answer that question from a previous slide the lead time is how long we have and I have visualized that here for you this is pretty much how it looks so if we imagine the project duration as a train following tracks uh, from the past through the present to the future it will simply make its way along that and there's nothing we can do about it because time has its own dynamics and it will just go right and it will always go into the future whether we've made the best of it or not now let's be a designer here and design something and this is what you need to do the train is coming you can only judge it from the present because that is where you are you have to look at the train as it is now this will make you understand the train as best as you can you don't really look at it in the past as much you want to know what the train is now because that is the the accumulation of what the train has become over the course of its past and then you try to predict what the train will need once it is in the future and then you've done well okay totally simple concept there's nothing uh, strange about this now let's take a look at how not to do it and i'm pointing this out because uh, so many design students get this wrong so you're a designer and you're saying let's design something and then you go okay we're going to make the best train as we know it now and of course it will move into the future and then you have an old train you know because you've made one for what was then the present and the lead time has basically made sure that you are now yeah stuck with an old piece of uh, equipment so the trick is this do look at the train as it is now but project from there what it will be like and the arrow that you see there the orange arrow that is your lead time okay there are several methods you can use as a designer to predict the future and these really work they're called forecasting methods and you can do some uh, deeper reading on that if you like this is uh, stuff from the areas of design and product development there may also be something in sections like urban planning and architecture and engineering <coughs> the informed opinion is a fairly good way to predict the future let's use Elvis Presley here as an example and let's just say that all the copyrights on Elvis songs are going to lapse in about 10 years from now what will happen therefore in 10 years well we will see a lot more Elvis songs on the radio so Elvis will become better known again and there will be more Elvis impersonators because he is better known right 
So this is an informed opinion because we know that the copyright will lapse. And the opinion is that this will probably make him more popular again because you no longer have to pay for the stuff. And because he's more popular, people will start reflecting and then they have more Elvis impersonators. So here's one future prediction. You could do an average approach. You know, on average, there have always been around 6,000 Elvis impersonator in operation in the world around the year since, since, since around the year 16,000, uh, 1960. Um, <clears throat> and, and therefore, we can probably assume that this will continue. So this, this method is a bit pledgehammer and, you know, not very subtle. But it's a, it's a starting point. You can say, okay, this is the average. Let's work with that to begin with. The problem with it is, of course, if you've read Douglas Adams' uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you'll end up with a situation like the average person in the universe has two heads and 16 arms and owns a hyena or something like that. So it is, uh, it can be a little off, but it's a starting point and it's better than nothing. You can extrapolate, which is fairly clever and a bit better than the average. <clears throat> it works like this. So by 1960, there was one Elvis impersonator, the one person who pretended to be Elvis Presley. By, 19, by 1980, we already had 2,000. Today, we have 6,000. So if you create yourself a graph with these figures in mind, there should, in theory, be 80,000 of these guys by 2050. Of course, we're laughing now, as this is clearly bollocks. We don't see this happening, do we? But... Um, you can sometimes make a future prediction on that basis if something really is growing as um, as linear as, as that. In some cases, it might, you know, like uh, consumer data, for example. If you're looking at uh, simple calculations of the developing world, if you have the average person in Africa buying two bars of soap per month, um, when they're earning $50 a month, how much will they probably buy when uh, they earn $250? Stuff like that. You can do a trend estimation, <clears throat> which may mean you're not really looking at how many uh, impersonators there was. You're just looking at the, the average dynamics um, of the trend. So if by and large you observe that it's been going down, Will probably continue to go down and unless you have very good reason to believe that there will be a break in that development and something will bounce it back up but if we don't have that then it's quite safe to assume that an ongoing trend will continue technology forecasting okay this is a bit more complex and you need to know stuff for that Let's say hologram technology is becoming ready for the market. So what might that mean for Elvis stuff? Maybe all of a sudden, whoever is selling hologram uh, equipment will want to have a dancing Elvis in their shops because it's simply a very good icon to um, demonstrate the abilities of uh, the equipment. So it's, it's a bit of a guess, obviously, because this could also be Michael Jackson or whatever, Mark Bolan. But <clears throat> the idea is certain technologies will probably bring back certain things or are making it likely. So if you're all about marketing Elvis stuff, then you will probably be looking forward to holographic technology because here's your next chance. Or you could do something like this, pattern recognition. We know, for example, that the popularity of Elvis songs is following a certain rhythm. And it's perfectly possible that it will continue to do so. You just need to know what that rhythm or that pattern is. Right, so we have... Um, analyzed things, we have made predictions for the future, now we are trying to sell to our team, to our company, to our client that change is necessary and we will need to explain that to them, we will need to justify it. This is something we do with needs. 
Now there are three kinds of needs that we can use to sell something or to um, convince somebody that change is required. The inarticulate need here is probably the most relevant one to the area of uh, predicting the future because an inarticulate need is a need that your client or customer or consumer doesn't know yet they're going to have. My favorite example here is coffee. I predict that the rise of the sales of electric cars is going to increase coffee sales because there will be so many people standing next to their cars waiting 20 minutes to get up to 80% charge. What do you do when you have 20 minutes standing next to a car? You go off and search for a coffee. So I think there will be a lot of cafes with electric car charging points and there will be a lot of car charging points with coffee vending machines. You can also predict the future with old customer needs. If the police has so far been using safety equipment and stab-proof vests and bulletproof vests, it's pretty likely they're going to continue to use stab-proof vests and bulletproof vests. And once laser weaponry becomes available, well, guess what? They're going to have something also that will protect them from laser weapons. So this is one way to tell the future. And then there's the market needs. Sometimes you just need to stay awake and realize what the market demands. If suddenly everybody wears red wigs, well, you better make sure you have red wigs. And perhaps you can even imagine what the red wigs will bring about. Yeah, maybe red wigs are going to require cleaning. So invest in some wig cleaning agents and their development. Is there something that you can do to influence the future as a designer? The thing is this, <clears throat> any innovation you bring, any change you propose will fall within one of these four fields here. And you can become systematic and strategic about how you would do that. So you could decide that as a designer, you are going to pursue a path of sustaining innovation. And please don't mistake that for sustainable innovation. It sounds very much similar, but it's not. Sustaining innovation means innovation that brings something existing up to date. It's like plastic surgery. It's like updating something, refreshing something. In the car industry, you see a lot of that. The new model always looks a little bit like the old model. And that's because the old model has its merits and has its consumers and has its uh, lovers and you don't want to alienate them so you're bringing up the new vehicle to speed really so that it is good enough for the requirements of the foreseeable future but it's only slightly refreshed you're sustaining that vehicle that model you may also approach your innovative process as a designer like this it's a little more radical Disruptive innovation means that, let's just say we're a car manufacturer, you go from petrol engines to electric or hydrogen or something. So they're still making cars, but they're doing them in a different way now. That's disruptive innovation. Sometimes simple research can be a, a way of doing innovation especially when you're a designer. When we're doing conceptual stuff, that's really research because we are putting something out there that may never become reality. It's a hypothesis. So when you go to a, a car show and you see these concept cars, they have made these out of boredom or to entertain you. They have made these to show what they can do, to test what kind of reactions may come back about this from the public. And, yeah, to just see if they're going to go ahead with any of this in the future. And at last, it may be perfectly possible that in your capacity as a research and development worker, you come across technology that will be a game changer. So if we stay with the car industry here, 
Let's just say teleportation comes up. Well, do you think people will still want cars if you can just beam yourself somewhere? Well, I think they won't. And that is why a totally revolutionary idea is always a great justification for innovation. If something comes about that will completely change the game, you switch to that. And that is then a breakthrough innovation. Okay, so this is an innovation matrix just to help you describe <clears throat> what kind of change you're proposing for the future. Now, if you're going to do it yourself <clears throat> in a systematic way, you can do a lot of things. <clears throat> First of all, you can spy on your rivals. The rivals probably being other companies. And this is quite commonly done, again, by the car industry, by these guys. They are professional photographers who photograph the prototypes that are being tested by car manufacturers in places like Sweden, Nevada, Arizona, which are the usual testing grounds for the, the new vehicles. And they are selling these images to magazines and to other companies. It's worth a lot of money. Um, so that everybody stays informed. So these guys are basically like spies. You can go to a trade fair, see what everybody does. Yeah, everybody is, or not everybody, but a lot of companies are quite happy to showcase their capabilities. And if it's not your main rival company itself, it may well be the companies that uh, produce the components for them. So you may not know what your rival is up to, but you may know what company they cooperate with to get their components and just see what they do. Maybe they'll be just as happy to sell that to you. You can do patent searches. If you find stuff patented by a company, you can be pretty sure that they're probably going to use it in future because if, you, if you're not going to use it, um, you're not going to have a patent. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. You may have a patent um, in order to make sure nobody uses it. But um, it's more likely that a company that patents something themselves are doing it to secure the exclusive right to it. And then, obviously, you can just read up on it at the patent office and you know what they're going to do. So patents can predict the future to a certain extent. What is patented now will probably see the light of day soon. Car shows I've already talked about. Sorry about the glamour girls. Um, they are pretty, aren't they? But um, this is simply how that business works. They always have all these people. I just grabbed that image from a website. This is a wonderful thing. Um, some people go totally open source. So... Um, some companies may be giving away their patents. Some company, companies may be giving away their ideas. Here's one example of a company doing that. And it may well be um, in companies' interests to give away their ideas so that others are using it because that helps you create a, a, a broader base, a broader infrastructure for that technology. If suddenly everybody goes electric cars, well, obviously you'll have uh, uh, filling stations everywhere and uh, it, will be a, it will be a better world for your technology because everybody is in on it. So open source <clears throat> portals can also predict the future, probably even more so than uh, patents because a patent may stay under lock and key open source technology that everybody shares, well, it's probably going to find its, its takers and somebody will do it. Another way for you to predict the future is to get completely coldly analytical. And then you use these six different techniques that I've explained earlier to do this. First of all, to build yourself an informed opinion, you just find out what we know for sure. So we know for sure what kind of technology is coming up. We know that because we may have spied on our rival companies 
We may even have read press releases by our rival companies. We may have read patents by our rival companies or by other companies or by researchers. We know what's coming up, right? If you're, if you're into technology, if you're a bit geeky, you will know that stuff. There may also be changes in legislation that um, make changes required. I mean, for example, at the moment here, as of 2017, we're talking a big change towards electric cars in China. I think they have a goal of selling 20% of all vehicles on the market will have to be electric. That is a legislation change. So we know this is going on. This is a clear prediction for the future. There probably are going to be 20% electric cars in China soon. Another thing you can do here is use the average approach. How has it traditionally been? Is there a dominant design now with regards to electric cars? We can say, yeah, there probably has been. Uh, as of 2017, Tesla and Renault are pretty much the, the dominant brands, I believe, in that region. Do we know <clears throat> what the absorptive capacity is? You know what the absorptive capacity is, okay? It's um, how ready your context is for change. That means if you're going to bring 20% electric cars to China, you better make sure there are 55 million um, charging stations available as well. So if you have less than that, and I'm just making that number up, of course, but if you have less than that, then your absorptive capacity for that technology is too low. So how ready is your context? That is the absorptive capacity. And do we have any old customer needs that we need to um, look at? And we can probably predict that perhaps the police in China will probably go for electric cars because they have already used electric cars in, in recent years. When we extrapolate, we might ask, what if things continue with the current trends as they are now? So, for example, we can take performance benchmarks from that. We know the performance of current electric cars. Yeah, Tesla accelerates from 0 to 60 miles an hour in something like 3 seconds. People are taking that for granted. It's a benchmark. So that is how the future one will be. Any other criteria that you want to extrapolate, you know? Has it... Uh, what kind of range, for example, would you want from your electric car and then the capacity of your auxiliaries if you're going to create an electric car if you're going to design an electric car capable of 1000 miles of range that's all good but can the battery manufacturers actually give you that so these are your auxiliaries if you do trend estimation we know trend is just looking at is it going up or down where is it all going Look at developments in other fields. If the trend towards electric cars has been going up so far, could there be trends in other fields that go against that? How do you feel, for example, about the fact that they're shutting down all these nuclear power plants? Do you, do you think we're going to have enough power for everybody to charge an electric car? Coming demographics. How many young people these days have driving licenses as compared to before? Perhaps we're not going to need that many charging stations because not that many people will be buying cars. And will there be more legislation somewhere about something? These are all things that can predict trends for you. Technology forecasting, so as I said before, what kind of technology is brewing in the field? Check your research publications out, not yours, but those of, you know, uh, revered scientists. Check out patents. Go to trade shows. And then do we have any historical regularities that can help us? The technology S-curve. We know, for example, that 
any new technology is hot when it first comes out but then eventually people will get used to it and perhaps another thing will come up that's hotter and I'm already predicting that the electric battery car as we know it may only be hot until the fuel cell car really takes off the hydrogen powered fuel cell car because that is still a little hotter a little hotter really the punctuated equilibrium is something you might have heard about the punctuated the punctuated equilibrium basically boils down to somebody will come up with new technology and eventually somebody will do something with it we are in the middle of that right now there are a lot of technologies that are being brought up to manufacturing um, uh, contexts now and uh, again the fuel cell I think is currently at a stage of its punctuated equilibrium where you can expect to see more of it soon and perhaps design research can tell us a few things about uh, yeah what what may be going on in future design research simply tells us um, what everybody is trying So whatever you did here, you may, you may have done all these six, you might just have done one or whatever in between. Um, it boils down to what will be required in future and what will be valued in future. And that is how you forecast <clears throat> emerging needs and emerging values. And then you're responding to that using every source that you can lay your hands on. And the synthesis of that. So this, I think, here is is how to predict the future. And then, what will it actually bring? The future. It it may be partly up to you. You do have a say in this, you know, because you're a contributor. You are in a creative profession, and we are the future makers. But it's not just you, of course. There will be others who make decisions and there will be there will be factors that will influence it. But I think the main thing to take away from this is what you do, what you put forward makes a difference. Yeah, it, It's not the same as if you had never said anything when you say something. So I wish you all the best and make sure you have your say about how the future is going to be.